Welcome to Hackbits, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. All right, welcome everyone to the Hackbits uh, podcast. I'm really excited to have uh, someone on today that uh, that I find super interesting. He's crazy smart, so I'm really excited to have him on the uh, podcast to discuss um, a, a plethora of things, uh, especially of all things cy- uh, cybersecurity. So uh, today's guest is Paul Cagliazzo. Uh, Paul, I hope I said it correctly. I know we just had this discussion, so. You got it. Perfect. So uh, I'm really excited to have you on here. So why don't you introduce this to yourself? Tell me a little bit about yourself and Advertium, the company you work for. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm excited to be on here as well, Gaspar. So thank you for inviting me. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Paul. Um, I am Avertium CISO. So I manage all of our internal security compliance, but really that's kind of a small component of my position here. Uh, the larger part of it is really focused on technology alliances and, and the companies that we choose to go to market with um, in, in search of solving problems for customers. So ultimately that's really my job as sort of chief problem solver. And, you know, if you look back at my career, I'd say that's probably the key thing that I've really focused on, on doing is, is solving the most complex cyber problems I could, I could find. Um, <laughs> so I've got about 25 years of experience in this industry, um, you know, dating back to the late 90s, you know, before it really was uh, an industry. It was just, you know, sort of one of those things that, um, you know, interested technologists kind of got their hands dirty on. And, you know, certainly I spent some time war driving back in the day. Uh, I imagine some of your audience has as well. Um, and uh, moved into uh, a role supporting federal government, uh, doing some interesting DOD stuff with a couple of military organizations, um, both you know here in the Middle East, uh, supporting some counterterrorism missions in Northern Africa, and ultimately decided you know I kind of wanted to get back to uh, you know uh, something a little bit less stressful. So I ended up uh, in the financial industry and uh, supported some again cyber missions within the financial industry. Uh, also some pseudo government agencies in that space as well, like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Um, and then eventually I just decided, you know, it was something I could do myself and kind of went on, on my own, uh, founded a company in 2008 um, that ultimately I sold to a private equity group out of Silicon Valley called Sunstone Partners in 2018. Um, and Sunstone purchased a couple of other companies at around the same time that ultimately became a Verdium. And so at the end of the day, I'm still working for the company I founded in 2008, just a, a, a pretty significantly different role than, uh, you know, founder CEO as I was. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Avertium in a second, but I'm more interested in this. So so I think I'm a little bit older than you, uh, but what when you first started getting into uh, technology, like what, what was your kind of your first computer? What did you start tinkering on and when was that? Oh boy. Um, so I, yeah, I'm 42. I'll be 43 in a couple of weeks. And um, I, I was really fortunate in that my father uh, was also a technologist and he was early in IT and, and really effectively in a security role for a federal agency uh, really early on. And uh, I can remember from the earliest uh, memories having computers at home. I remember specifically a very large rectangular uh, compact with, that had the little green screen on it and the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. And that, you know, I used to play around with uh, in our basement and pretty much just grew from there when, you know, the, the IBM PC came out, I definitely built a bunch of computers and I still enjoy tinkering around with that sort of thing as well. But yeah, as early as I can remember, I had computers and, and just technology devices in general. Yeah, I, very similar with me, some similar background, uh, except my parents owned a pizza place. So, <laughs> but but they were smart enough. Someone, a traveling salesman came in one day and sold them a computer that they brought home when I was 10. And it was a Timex Sinclair 1000. I still have it, actually. And it was oh, a wow. two, 2K of memory with, uh, with they, they, they splurged and bought the memory upgrade for 16K. So, uh, but back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of software can buy. So you had to kind of learn to, to program on your own. And yeah. uh, that's kind of where my love for it started. But, uh, but it, it, you know, that having that kind of history, I think, uh, goes a long way in this industry, like understanding and kind of seeing the growth 
over all these years of having to knowing the struggles of like you know sitting on a 600 baud or a 1200 baud modem to right. where we are today it, it's like it's like it's almost like i couldn't imagine it back then because i i talk to people and say i remember the first piece of digitized music i downloaded and it was uh 15 seconds of sharp dressed man by zz top <laughs> and and i was on a commodore 64 and i downloaded it and it must have taken you know 37 hours to get yeah. it and but i gotta tell you when I, I remember hearing that and it sounded like magic you know, like just to hear this coming out of a computer system, not some sort of radio, uh, it was amazing. So having that background, I think, and 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 being able to tinker at an early age, uh, man, what a, what a great way to kind of um, you know learn the ins and outs of hardware, and also have a great understanding of cybersecurity. I think because it taught me a lot, and I'm not sure if you feel that way, but just being involved and immersed in it was was a great was a great uh, great advantage. I, I completely agree with that, Esprit. I, I think you know understanding how these different technologies work together, you know, from the ground up, even at the hardware level, certainly helps you understand how to break them. Um, and, you know, ultimately how bad guys might break them as well. So I, I think that's absolutely key. You know, one of the things that's also, you know, I think been a part of my career is I've done so many different things, whether it be, you know, database administration or website design or network engineering, um, all of those things, they, you know, in one way, shape or form, they're relevant to the cybersecurity mission. And at the end of the day, all, you know, any environment has many different technologies that have to work together in concert. Uh, and that's often that integration or those, those, the, the data moving from one technology to another is where the, the process usually breaks down. So really understanding how those things all work, I think, is absolutely critical. And so to me, you know, the, the notion of a generalist, um, I don't necessarily think that that's a pejorative term. I think generalist in the cybersecurity discipline can be very good uh, because you, it provides you a very big picture perspective of how, you know, again, uh, different technologies work together and ultimately might break down. There's certainly space for specialization, of course. I mean, you know, you have to have people that are very specialized in certain uh, specific skill sets. But for me, being a generalist has been definitely beneficial to to my career. I agree. So, so tell me a little bit, a little bit about Advertium, uh, the company itself. Tell me, uh, uh, you know, where you're based out of and and what the company focuses on. Yeah, sure. So I'm based out of Northern Virginia, uh, just outside of Washington D.C., which which I think reflects who largely my company's customer base was prior to it becoming a Verdium, um, being again government. But um, we have, we're a uh, managed detection and response company. Um, we're also a cyber consultancy. So about 50% of our companies focused on delivering professional services, consulting engagements. So things like virtual chief information security officer work or penetration testing or compliance work around, you know, HIPAA, high trust, PCI, stuff like that. We do all that stuff day in and day out. Um, on the other half of our business is the 24-7 threat detection and response practice. So for that, we have three 24-7 security operation centers. We call them cyber fusion centers. Uh, those are located in Tennessee, uh, Arizona, and Colorado. And you know, within those CFCs, we operate SIMs, um, EDR platforms, vulnerability scanning platforms, threat intelligence platforms for you know, hundreds of customers across pretty much every industry. Um, there's not really an industry that we're like centered on or focused specifically on, uh, but there there are some industries we've got more customers than others. Um, but by and large, that's that's really it. So we monitor you know millions of devices day in and day out, looking for interesting you know anomalous behavior or attacker TTPs that you know will often ultimately become. Uh, an incident, preferably if we can stop the incident from happening, that's ideal. But um, you know, often they do become incidents because, you know, simply no prevention is perfect. So, uh, job is to detect and respond. Sure, and and, and uh, for disclosure, Verdium is a valued partner of our of Life Ours, and you know, my day job, I'm the chief product officer at Life Ours, and uh, you know, we love working with you guys. And I, I took a tour of. Um, uh, of uh, a bunch of different facilities around the United States, and and I've met with a lot of different companies, and and your company just is impressive. You know, I just um, I, I feel like uh, your staff and everything is just at such a high level and very professional that it's always great to have a partner like that. Uh, yeah, with I, us. I appreciate that. We we certainly value our partnership with you all as well, and I think really you know what we care most about is that we do a good job for our customers. So focusing on developing our, our team, making sure that they're empowered to be successful, that they've got the right environment to be successful in, that there's you know, opportunities for advancement and career growth and continued development. Those are really, really important to us. Um, it, you know, from a, like a core value standpoint, that's one of the key things is, is character matters. And we want to continuously develop our staff because, you know, as you know, and I'm sure the audience knows, it's really, really difficult to find quality staff and to keep them. Uh, this, is, this is such an in-demand industry that 
you know, staff turnover can be really, really detrimental to the success of a mission. And so focusing on ensuring our team, you know, continuously has the opportunity to get better uh, and experience new things is important. So, so we're in the fourth quarter, we're in Q4, and the year is wrapping up. So what are your thoughts so far about 2021 and cybersecurity? Where, where do you think it's, uh, you know, it's been, been an interesting year, right? We've had uh, Kaseya happen, and we yeah. had the uh, solar wind. So, you know, it's been, there's a lot going on. So wh- what is your thoughts on, on 2021 so far, and, and, and where do you think it's heading? Yeah, well, so I think a couple of key things uh, happened in 2021. So you mentioned the software supply chain stuff. Uh, that's really it started well before 21, but probably the best example of that would have been Solar Winds, which was you know December of last year. But then the Kaseya attack really I think brought that uh, even more more to the fr- forefront. Um, so software supply chain risk is something that I think is going to really continue to be a problem going forward, and I think it's one of the more challenging problems that our industry has to solve. Because, you know, we don't want to disincent people from keeping up with patches, but if ultimately a patch is poisoned and results in a major incident that reflects, um, you know, the compromise of hundreds or thousands of, of, of companies, you know, you, you kind of get a little bit gun shy about applying that patch too quickly. So you might want to operate an N minus one sort of release uh, mode just to try to stave off that potential supply chain risk. But there again, you may just be accepting the fact that you've got critical vulnerabilities that are not patched because you're N minus one. So a really challenging problem, and I think that's going to continue to be the case. Um, you know, worst nightmare for me would be you know if a major software provider, let's say a Microsoft or someone like that, had a software supply chain issue that affected millions and millions of devices. I don't know what the world would do uh, right. for that to, to actually happen. Um, so that does scare me. The other big thing this year, I think, is, of course, and Kaseya was also an, uh, an example of this, is ransomware. Um, you know, it's everywhere and it's uh, it's destabilizing to the economy from a, su- a supply chain standpoint in and of itself. If you look at like some of the incidents that got a lot of press around Colonial Pipeline or JBS Meats or you know some of the other ones that um, really disrupted supply chains. So I think, you know, supply chain is probably the key um, uh, sort of trend that that I'm observing, at least in what we're seeing. And I think that's that's only going to continue next year. Yeah. And, and I think that we're going to see that reflected in uh, cybersecurity uh, insurance uh, premiums uh, going up, because I think that, uh, you know, years ago when you got cybersecurity and when you when you got this insurance and you were you, you thought you were protected, uh, one of the things that uh, I remember, I was a director of IT at a company, and I think I filled out a one-page form. You know, like, hey, do you do you have antivirus? Yeah, sure, check. You know, it was pretty easy. And I think they've kind of wised up and said, wait a second, I think we really need to dive a little bit deeper and audit these uh, companies that we decide to insure because they don't want to be responsible for millions of dollars in fines. And I think it's you know it's getting scary out there. Oh, absolutely. So we work pretty closely with with a number of insurance carriers and. One of the things that they, you know, we heard from them is that over the last, you know, 18 to 24 months, their loss ratios just went through the roof. They're losing so much money specifically because of ransomware and payouts on ransomware that they had to do something different. So you're, you're absolutely right. They are looking with more scrutiny at the insureds. Uh, there's a couple of uh, key controls that I think they're going to be mandated uh, to renew any policy or to, uh, to purchase new policy. I think starting next year, and that's multi-factor authentication um, and EDR and point detection response. And I think those two controls will go a long way to preventing, uh, you know, ransomware attacks or other incidents that have you know significant losses associated with them. But it's probably you know a little bit too late uh, because you know, like I said, they've lost millions and millions of dollars over the last couple of years. Oh yeah, and then there's a, you know there's a people problem too because it's mm-hmm. hard. To, you know, how do you you have companies have to make sure that their employees are trained. Uh, to 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 try to uh, lessen the, the the burden on on the IT department because uh, you know if you're opening up e- every email to get uh, and click on a button to get a free donut and then realize yeah. that you're not getting that free donut and I, I'm actually using a real world example because <laughs> that's actually I, I, I it happened before uh, you know everyone loves donuts so you get an email saying click here to get your free Dunkin' Donut then you're going to click on that and, I, I might, and who I knows what happens I might click on that yeah and you're yeah. right I hear this a lot actually like uh, you know we're talking to maybe a mid sized company. And the perspective they have is, you know, we're not that interesting. We're not um, anybody's target. Nobody's really coming after us. And you know what? That may be true, but it it sort of doesn't matter, right? You might be targeted. You might not be. Uh, All it takes is one person to make the wrong decision, click the wrong link, and you have the same bad day as if you were targeted. So it's something that you're you're completely right. People need to be aware. um, And that's also a problem that's not going away anytime soon. So where do you think we'll be five years down the road? What, what do you kind of think you're take out that crystal ball and what, what do you kind of see happening in the future? 
five years. Um, boy, that's a pretty long time horizon. I honestly, I don't think the problems are going away. I think we're going to still see issues with information governance. Um, and I think the continued diaspora of data is just going to, you know, accelerate. And by that, I really mean, you know, now we're all comfortable working from home. I don't think that uh, toothpaste is going back in the tube. So it's only going to get, you know, more complicated attack surfaces that we're going to have to prevent uh, issues from from uh, happening within. And I, I think that's going to continue. I think maybe controls we might see rise in terms of, um, you know, their, their popularity could be more of the deception stuff. I think deception is fairly uh, new. I don't see many mid-market organizations deploy deception technology, but that could be a deterrent uh, sort of mid-kill chain for a successful attack. That might be one that I would see some growth in. Um, I could also see some of the other nation state actors, uh, maybe less of, of, uh, of Russia. And I think Russia, you know, is, is probably pretty obviously responsible for a lot of the ransomware that's out there. But I, I could see other um, geographies get involved in the ransomware ecosystem because um, it's so profitable. And um, being, you know, part of the, the vector for an espionage attack, I think would be really interesting, too. And I, we've seen some of that with the double extortion ransomware attacks over the last couple of years where data is stolen. Um, and, you know, the bad guys will purport to delete the data or destroy the data. I'd be very surprised if they did. And, you know, again, if there's any sort of uh, nation state activity there, that's an awesome opportunity for them to collect a lot of really sensitive data and store it, um, you know, for potential espionage purposes going forward. So, I, you know, that I think is going to continue. I don't expect there's going to be too much, um, you know, overall improvement in uh, cyber hygiene. And, you know, it's, it's sort of... Um, Depressing as a cyber guy to say that, but I, yeah. you know, it's, you know, we've had 20 plus years uh, of, 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 you know, guys like you and I beating the drum on, you know, do the job of cyber hygiene, train your staff, and it's just not getting better. You know, maybe it will with added attention uh, from an executive level uh, within, you know, governments, but uh, I'm not terribly optimistic. I'm with you. It's it's it is a little depressing. So uh, you know, I, like I said, I think uh, when when someone can be enticed by just a, a free donut, uh, it makes me worry about what else uh, is going on out there. And and look, an IP, um, you know, uh, 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 nation states stealing IP from 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 companies is is mm-hmm. just going to get worse. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I, I think that that training of hey, don't stick a thumb drive in your computer and download any, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen on the people side of things as long and the technology. Sure. Um, but it's it's a, it's a battle, right? That's constantly fought. Yeah. And and I'm glad there's company uh, people like you and Advertium and 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 LifeRs. Uh, out there fighting these battles because I try to tell folks there is a war going on and it's yeah. a, it happens daily. You, uh, most people don't know about it until they hear it on the news or you know they get that they get that uh, that letter in the mail saying that uh, all their data has been compromised and right. you know it's out there on the web. Uh, it, it's 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 a little scary, um, you know. So, but what are our choices, right? We live in this world and and we all love to use technology. And I think the more that uh, you know we become addicted to these uh, devices that we hold in our hands, right? Um, um, the more these problems are not going away. So uh, it's a battle we have to keep fighting. And then, you know, we keep fighting the good fight. And that's why uh, I guess I guess if there's ever comes a day that you and I don't have jobs anymore, I guess we just open up a donut shop. And <laughs> so. I'll take you up on that. If, if, if the day comes where we don't have jobs anymore because this problem is solved, I will sleep well that night. <laughs> there you go. All right, Paul, look, I appreciate your time with us. I'm looking forward to you guys joining us for the VIP event that we're having in a, in a, in a week or two. I think it's uh, November 9th. Uh, we're going to have a cyber uh, cyber mystery, uh, which it, which talks about a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. So uh, putting that together and you guys participating has really been a pleasure. So I'm really excited to have you guys to be one of our sponsors and, and, and look forward to having you uh, on the uh, program next week yeah looking forward to it as well we are excited to to join and uh you know we, we joined last year's vip event it was a lot of fun and uh, we made some uh really good relationships with some of the other attendees there so excited to be there okay well paul thank you so much for joining me um and uh, we'll talk again soon all right thanks Gaspar.